In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for another beautiful and wonderful day that you have given each one of us. Father God, you are such an awesome God. You give us this privilege as your children to come to this class so that you can speak to our hearts. You can give us those secrets. You can give us the revelation. You can trigger something in our life where you can use us for your glory. Where you, Lord, can be glorified through each one of us. Today, once again, Spirit of God, as you teach us the word, we ask you once again, Spirit of God, to come and take complete control of this class. Take complete control of all our faculties, our heart, our mind, our lips, our tongue, our thoughts, and let every word that you're going to speak to us not be wasted, not go astray, but Lord, allow every word to be caught into our spirit, to be caught on the soil of our hearts, so that this word can germinate and produce the fruit of your kingdom in our lives. At this very moment, Lord, as I share the word, nothing of me, everything of you. Make this teaching practical for us. Give us understanding, O Holy Spirit, so that as we apply all that we are learning each day, we can live the victorious life that Jesus has promised us. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, my dear brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to each one of you. Today, we are going to reflect on the day's gospel from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Now, brothers and sisters, before we go to today's gospel, I want to just go back for a few verses before verse number 28. In fact, I want to take you to verses 25 to 27. Please understand our verses are 28, 29 and 30 from Matthew chapter 11. But I just want to take you back to three or four verses before that. So we understand the context in which today's gospel is going to be spoken to us. And we also need to understand what is Jesus trying to teach us in the last verses, which is a continuation of what he's going to teach us in these three verses in 28, 29 and 30. So let us read verses 25 to 27, 25 to 27. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So here in this verse, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is praying to his father. He's actually praying to his father and he's saying, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and you have revealed them to infants. You have re revealed them to little infants. You know, my brothers and sisters, in the natural, do you think that anybody will ever give go and ask a small little child to go and sit in university or do their PhD or do some theology or study some very intelligent things? Absolutely not. You will never find because before we send somebody to the 10th standard that the child has to go to kindergarten, has to go to first, second, third. And here the Lord is talking exactly the opposite. He is saying that the wise and the intelligent have been have been prevented from getting all the secrets of the kingdom but all these secrets and all these revelations have only been given to infants whom is he talking about is he talking about the infants who are who are absolutely small is he talking to small children absolutely not my brothers and sisters he is talking to every child of the kingdom of god and how do we become children of god we become children of God when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we are turned inside 
inside we are completely changed we are born anew and therefore brothers and sisters when we accept Jesus and we are born again we are born of the spirit now we become children of the heavenly father 1 John uh, chapter John chapter 1 verse number 12 we saw that yesterday how does somebody become a child of God Jesus said those who believed in the son those who believed in the son he gave the power to become the children of God. So how are you and I going to receive the power to become children of God? By believing in Jesus, by being born again. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So when we believe in Christ and when we are in Christ, we are a new creature. We are born again and now because we are born again and Christ lives on the inside of us the Holy Spirit is going to start giving us the revelations of the kingdom brothers and sisters if, if the world thinks today by doing a lot of education by studying degrees by doing post graduation doing theology doing doctorate and doing all sorts of laws they are going to become wiser they are absolutely wrong because this scriptures from 25 to 27 tell us that these things are hidden from those who are intelligent or those who are wise according to God's according to the world standard but those who are born again those who have accepted Christ they may not have gone to college they may not have good known theology they may not know all the wisdom of this world but if they are born again and they are really children of God then the wisdom of God the revelation and secrets of God are going to be revealed only to the children of God and that is why Jesus is praying to his father and he's saying father I'm so I'm amazed that you have hidden all these things from the intelligent and the clever and revealed them to only children and you know my brothers and sisters if you see what Jesus is saying here this particular verse is actually totally against the wisdom of this world what Jesus is saying from verses 25 to 27 is totally against the wisdom of this world. I mean, people of this world will never ever think that somebody who's uneducated, somebody who's not studied, who's never gone and become a graduate, somebody who's never gone to college, somebody who's never studied, but right now being used by God, they will never be able to understand that because it is beyond human wisdom. It is beyond the world's understanding to think that God can provide a wisdom to, to his children without being taught in this world. If we are taught by the Holy Spirit, the wisdom that we receive, the intelligence that we receive, the secrets that we receive of the kingdom, the revelation knowledge that we get is mind boggling. It is beyond what this world can ever teach us. And you know, my brothers and sisters, just like these verses where Jesus is talking about the wisdom of this world is different in the same way Jesus is talking about in verses 28 29 and 30 he is not talking to people of this world he is talking to children of God he is talking to those who believe in the in the son Jesus Christ and who are now born again who have who now are in a position to receive that revelation knowledge so with this background let us now read today's gospel from Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30 and then we'll take verse by verse and we'll reflect on that. Come to me, all you who are tired and carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Go ahead and read the whole verse, 28 to 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light so Jesus is saying to us in verse number 28 he's saying come to me all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest you know, my brothers and sisters, as I just told you in the previous verses, Jesus is not talking to people of this world. He's talking to only his children. He's only talking to those who have believed in his son, Jesus, because the wisdom of this world will tell us if you want rest, if you are carrying heavy burdens, you are tired, you are worn out, then go for a vacation to Honolulu. Go for a vacation by the seaside. 
just go and sleep for a few hours go to the seaside take some good rest and that is what the world will tell us they will say book a vacation in a nice five-star hotel or go to a, some particular country in the world and have a good vacation that's what the world will tell us but you know my brothers and sisters the way the carnal mind thinks is to work harder and burn the midnight oil and so on that's how the carnal mind works because the carnal mind thinking is if you want success you have to work hard you have to really burn the midnight oil you have to you have to struggle in life you have to do something in order to get success and here is jesus saying exactly the opposite he's saying come to me and rest come to me and rest you know my brothers and sisters there is a place in christ where all we do is simply respond to what jesus has already done i want to say that one more time you know there is a place in christ where all we do is come into the presence of god and do whatever he has i mean and receive what he has already done you know my brothers and sisters when we understand that christ lives on the inside of us what do we do if we want rest we only have to believe what jesus has already done for us we simply have to respond to the finished works of jesus christ you know most of the time my brothers and sisters when we want to take rest we will go to the to the internet we will go and ask our friends we'll ask our neighbor we'll ask our family you know we want to go for a vacation could you join us we want to go to this place and you know my brothers and sisters jesus is talking about not a physical rest here he is not talking about you know resting on a on a, on, a, on if you were sleeping on the floor go to one bed and sleep on a bed or if you were basically always in the mountains go to the seaside he is not talking about changing our location or he is not talking about taking rest in a place where you know if you have been cooking your food every day you go to a place where somebody is going to give you free food or somebody is going to feed you and and that will be your rest absolutely not my brothers and sisters i want to take you to hebrews chapter 4 verses 3 to 11 and you know my brothers and sisters in hebrew chapter 4 verses 3 to 11 we are actually going to go back to those people of israel who for 40 years in the desert did not obey the lord in fact moses was given the 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 the, the responsibility to lead a million jews from egypt to the promised land but these people were so rebellious they did not want to take the instructions of god they did not obey moses and as a result these very people were not able to reach the promised land they struggled they traveled every day they put their tents up they 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 struggled to take the manna they struggled to find the water in the desert if only they had to obey the instructions of the lord they would have experienced so much of joy and so much of rest but all along they just kept murmuring they kept complaining and as a result those people who left egypt they never reached the promised land they they all perished in the wilderness i want to show you a scripture from hebrew chapter 4 verses 3 to 11 describing the people of israel who who failed to find that rest and who failed to reach the promised land which god had promised to moses and to the people of israel let's read that for we who have believed enter that rest just as god has said as in my anger i swore Hebrews. they shall not enter that rest though his works were finished at the foundation of the world for in what place it speaks about the seventh day as follows and god rested on the seventh day from all his works and again in this place it says they shall not enter my rest since therefore it remains open for some to enter it and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience again he sets a certain day today saying through david much later in the words already quoted today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts for if joshua had given them rest 
God would not speak later about another day. So then, a Sabbath rest still remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from His. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. So my brothers and sisters, in these verses in Hebrews chapter 4, we read about the people of Israel who were so disobedient to God that they did not follow simple instructions that God gave them through Moses. And you know my brothers and sisters, all the verses that we just read, they are talking about rest. You know my brothers and sisters, when we talk about rest, we are not talking about a physical rest. I want to just show you, I want to explain to you something. You know, just as God ceased from all work after creation, you and I also must cease from all our works. And how do we do that? How do we understand that? What is the meaning of that? You know, God created the heavens and the earth. If you read the book of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And the word of God says, on the seventh day, God rested. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when people read the word God rested on the seventh day, does it really mean that God stopped doing any work on the seventh day? It's not that God stopped doing any work on the seventh day. It's not that he rested and from seventh day onwards, he just rested. The point, the word of God, when it is truly understood in the proper perspective, what really happened is it took the, it took the heavenly father six days to, 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 you know, create the whole world, the universe, the heavens, the earth, the human beings, everything. And on the end of the sixth day, when he had created man, there was nothing more to create. He had done everything. And so on the seventh day, when the word of God says he rested, it meant that on the seventh day, God had finished all his work and he did not have to do anything more. You know, my brothers and sisters, when the Lord created the heavens and the earth, he did it in such a unique way that many people have still not understood that. You know, he didn't just create trees. He didn't just create plants. He did not just create animals. But he created them in such a way that they could reproduce. You know, my brothers and sisters, he put the sperm in a man. He put the egg in a woman. He gave the, every tree, fruit bearing tree, the, the, the fruit in which the, the seed was inside that fruit. And that fruit was in a position to reproduce itself. So, so what does it mean, brothers and sisters? It means he doesn't have to make new trees. He doesn't have to make new plants. He doesn't have to make new animals today. But his original act of creation, the what he did during creation, was done in such a way that he is resting ever since. So six days God created the heavens and the earth and after that God has not been creating anything new. You know my brothers and sisters, with this original act of creation, when it was already finished, God began to rest. He did it so perfectly and so completely that he hasn't had to create anything since he created the heavens, the earth and everything that is. And this is exactly what the old Sabbath was painting a picture of. You know, my brothers and sisters, what we read just now in Hebrews chapter 4 is actually like, like words which can be put into a picture. It was only a type or a shadow of what the New Testament was all about. It was talking about the rest that you and I would receive in the New Testament. Let us go and see what Colossians chapter 2 verse 17 says. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. This is only a shadow of what was to come, but the real substance is Jesus Christ. You know, my brothers and sisters, the Old Testament was not the reality in itself. It was only a shadow. For example, if I'm standing in the sun, the, if, if I stand in the sun, there is a shadow of mine which is there. It doesn't mean that shadow is, my, is me. Shadow is only because of the reflection of the sun against my body, which is now creating a shadow. And so everything that we read in the Old Testament is only a shadow. But the real thing is in the New Testament that you and I are living. And so, brothers and sisters, the Jews were commanded to take one day off. 
out of the seven days and devote it to worshipping the Lord as an act of worship that God was their source. That's exactly what the Old Testament talks about. In the Old Testament, people were told to work for six days. That means they had to work from Saturday up to Thursday, up to Friday. And Saturday was the day of Sabbath. So they were told to take one day off in order to worship the Lord, in order to make them realize that God is their source. Now, brothers and sisters, listen to this very carefully. In the natural, if you look at the in, in the natural world, it doesn't make sense at all. If they didn't work every day, how could they prosper as much as those who worked extra? There could have been people who did not follow the Sabbath. They would have worked even on the Sabbath day, which was at that time a Saturday. And so, in the natural, a person who works one day extra will obviously prosper more than a person who's only working for six days. But that's not the way it worked. Because of their faith in the Lord, which was expressed through their obedience to take the Sabbath day off, these people prospered more than those who worked for seven days a week. You know, my brothers and sisters, God was teaching them to rest in Him as their source and not in their works. I want to say this again. If you and I can understand this truth, brothers and sisters, it's going to set us free today. God was teaching the people in the Old Testament to rest in Him on that one day so that God would be their source and not their work, not that extra work that they do where they would get extra money. And again, I want to show you something more. To make it more clearer, the Lord told the Israelites somewhere in, in Leviticus 25. What did He say to them? You know, out of the seven years, He told them to take one year off out of the seven years so every six years at the end of the six years in the seventh year the israelites were not permitted to sow or reap in their crops they were not told they, they were not permitted that that which came up naturally that they had to leave in the fields for the poor and the beast of the land and some would say how are we going to eat in the seventh year if the Lord has told us that we should not sow, we should not reap, how are we going to live in the seventh year? That's what it says in Leviticus chapter 25 verse 20. Can we read that? Should you ask, what shall we eat in the seventh year if we may not sow or gather in our crop? Brothers and sisters, God has given the people of Israel and he's telling them, don't sow in the seventh year. Six years, you will sow, you will reap, do whatever you want. But the moment the seventh year comes, you are not going to touch your field. You are not going to sow, you are not going to reap. You know, my brothers and sisters, why did the Lord say that? Why did the Lord give this particular law? The Lord blessed their crops supernaturally in the sixth year so that their fields brought three times the normal harvest in the sixth year. Please listen to this, my brothers and sisters. If God has told them in the seventh year not to sow and reap, it means at the end of the sixth year, they would harvest a crop which is three times more than what they would get naturally. They would eat the harvest of the sixth year during the sixth year, the seventh year and the eighth year while their crops were growing. You know, my brother says all of this was to show them that God was their source. God wanted to show the people of Israel not to depend on their work, not to depend on their effort, not to depend on their hard work and labor. He wanted to show them that he was their source. He provided they obeyed his word. You know, my brothers and sisters, we may work and sow our crops. Today, as we live in the New Testament, many of us are working hard. Some of us are, some of us are taking extra time. Some of us are working overtime. Some of us are taking two, three jobs just to make ends meet. But it is God that gives us the increase. If we understand that God is our source, not our labor. And likewise, brothers and sisters, in the New Testament, Jesus has done everything for us. He has finished everything on the cross. He isn't still saving people or he isn't healing us. Many times people in the church today, when they have a problem, they will say, I am going to pray to God to bring healing to me. I'm going to pray to God to bring blessing upon me. I'm going to pray to God to prosper me. I am going to ask God to do something about it. You know, my brothers and sisters, that is absolutely incorrect. He has already done everything. He has already finished everything. All we are going to do is entering into what has already been provided for by Jesus. You know, my brothers and sisters, when we understand that Jesus has finished everything, we are entering into the rest 
of what Jesus has already completed for you and me on the cross. You know, my brothers and sisters, those who think that they have to act in a certain way to gain God's acceptance and approval are actually not resting in the finished works of Christ. You know, my brothers and sisters, let me, let me say this very clearly. Many times people can misunderstand. You know, we all need to live a holy life. There is no doubt about it. But we should, but that living a holy life should only be a fruit and not the root of our relationship with God. Many times people think that, you know, I have to live a holy life because if I live a holy life, then God is going to bless me. Brothers and sisters, that is not the truth. The truth is we live a holy life because of what he has done for us. That's the fruit of our relationship with Jesus. This is exactly what the Old Testament was a picture of. In the Old Testament, people had to be so legalistic. They had to do certain things. They had to do this. They had to do that. They had to follow the Sabbath law. They had to follow the rules and regulations. And they were so legalistic about observing the Sabbath law. You know, my brothers and sisters, let me, let me also give you another picture. Those who are legalistically observing the Sabbath, uh, Sabbath law today, you know, for example, there are people who, who go to church on that particular day on a Sunday. They go on a particular day on a Saturday. They go on a particular day on a Friday. I don't know which day they consider as the Sabbath. You know what happens when they observe the Sabbath day today with the same belief that God is going to be angry with them if they don't go to church or they don't pray. Are those people who are missing the true meaning of the Sabbath? Can you imagine brothers and sisters? If you think that God is angry with you because you did not go to church on a Sunday or you did not go to the Sabbath law, you are really missing the true meaning of the Sabbath. Those who are, these are really the ones who are actually breaking the Sabbath law. Can you imagine? You know, if you think that you're going to church because God will be angry and you want to do your obligation, don't go to church for your obligation. Please understand, God is not obligated to us and neither are we obligated to God. God wants us to come to in his presence because he loves us, my brothers and sisters. Many people today, they are so much particular about that Sunday mass. They are so much particular about going to church on a particular day because they believe if they don't do that, God is going to be angry. You know, my brothers and sisters, true Sabbath keepers in the New Testament are those who don't try to relate to God by their holiness but totally rely on what Jesus did for them to make them acceptable to the Lord. I want to say this one more time. If you can write it down in capital block letters, because this is exactly what it means about our relationship with God. True Sabbath keepers or those who keep the Sabbath in the New Testament are those who don't try and relate to God by their holiness but totally rely on what Jesus did for them to make them acceptable to the Almighty Father. You know, my brothers and sisters, it is talking about relationship. It is all about relationship. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship with the person Jesus Christ. And our relationship with Jesus Christ is not only on a Sunday. It's not only on the Sabbath day. It is 24-7 every moment of our life. That's a relationship to be enjoyed, my brothers and sisters, every day of our life and not just on a single day of the week. You know, my brothers and sisters, one of the main reasons why people have been bogged down with religion is because the church has not really taught the truth today for, to, its, to its congregation. When we understand that it is all about relationship it's all about you know having that intimacy with Christ we will begin to stop becoming legalistic and we will begin to start acting like really children of God every single moment of our life like yesterday we were talking Christmas is not on 25th if you understand the true meaning of Christmas that Christmas is the sun away from home then you will understand that you and I on this earth because we are children of the father we are away from our eternal home heaven and here we are to in order to fulfill your mission and my mission as long as we are living on this earth you know my brothers and sisters this is not understood uh, at this very moment for the simple reason because the truth is not being preached please understand my dear brothers and sisters if you understand what the early New Testament church did in the New Testament in the early church the New Testament church 
met on the first day of the week they stopped meeting on the sabbath day because the seven the sabbath day was the saturday it was the seventh day and so they changed it to sunday which was the the, the saturday was the jewish sabbath day they knew they were free from the observance of the of a day and were now living in the true sabbath rest they were resting in christ jesus you know my brand sisters when you and i understand that it is not about a particular hour or a particular day for example yesterday there was a there was a whatsapp message going on all around the place i don't know whether you received it some people received it that there will be an hour of grace there will be an hour of grace on the 8th of december can you imagine brothers and sisters can there be just an hour of grace every moment of our life is a moment of grace when we know the knowledge of the truth of god's word that's what it says in 2 peter chapter 1 verse 1 it says grace and peace be multiplied through the knowledge of god and our savior jesus christ so if you're going to depend on receiving grace for that one hour on the 8th of december where are we leading the church to from where do all these things originate? You know, my brothers and sisters, we are actually doing what the Old Testament saints did. We are following the law and the law has already been made obsolete by Jesus. So the question, my brothers and sisters, is why should we labor to rest? What is the reason we need to labor to rest? As I mentioned to you all this time, if we understood clearly what rest of the Lord is, then it takes effort to rest in the finished works of Jesus Christ. Let me say this once again. If what I've just explained to you a few minutes ago and you have understood what the rest of the Lord is, then it takes effort, it takes labor from our part to rest in the finished works of Jesus. For example, my brothers and sisters, our human nature wants to do something to be worthy of the Lord's blessings. We want to do something. We want to tell the Lord, Lord, look at me. I have prayed those nine novenas. I have gone to church every day. I have been fasting for the last 15 days. You know, I've been doing a lot. I've been waking up early in the morning and going for dawn masses. You know, Lord, I've been doing all this. It's time for you to bless me. You know, my brothers and sisters, the truth is that none of us can ever deserve the goodness of the Lord. None of us, not even the holiest person who walks on this earth can ever deserve the goodness of the Lord. We have to cease from trusting in our own works and rest in what Jesus has freely provided by his grace to us. It takes effort, my brothers and sisters. It will be the hardest thing you and I will ever do is to quit relating to God on the basis of our own works and start trusting totally in what Jesus did for you and me. You have to labor to that rest. You know, my brothers and sisters, please understand this. What the church is teaching today is exactly the opposite. We must labor to rest in his word and receive from Jesus' finished works on the cross instead of laboring in order to get God to move on our favor. You know, when we start doing something from our own side, we want to do some effort, we want to do some service, we want to give alms to the poor, we want to do something. And then we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, look at me. Look at the way I'm performing. Look at the way I'm serving you. It's time for you to bless me. Brothers and sisters, if you ever have taken such an attitude, this attitude actually disqualifies us from receiving anything from the Lord. Because there is nothing that you and I can do. We could climb up the mountains, we could go into the valleys, we could go fasting, we could be praying, we could do chain reaction, we could do storming of heaven. Nothing will work. It's only the finished works of Jesus. And when we believe in the finished works of Jesus, we believe what Jesus has done for us. Then we are trusting not in our own effort, but we are trusting in that Savior who has done everything for us. And because he has done everything for us, I trust my God as a child of the Father to receive that rest, to receive every good thing. Because I'm not the one who's going to work hard. It is his grace in me. It is his presence within me that is going to take me to my finishing line. You know, my brothers and sisters, if you can understand this and put this truth in your spirit, from today, you will stop acting like religious fanatics. You will stop acting like religious freaks. You will start becoming believers. You will start acting like children of God and this is a very important truth that Jesus talks to us in verse number 28 I don't know how many times in your lifetime you might have heard this scripture but today as the Lord is speaking to your heart let it be very clearly understood brothers and sisters 
we are not people who need to work to prove the Lord that we are good enough for him it is we who need to trust in Jesus what he has finished for you and me because of his love for us on the cross and receive it as a free gift gift and when we can trust him in with our whole life that's the time we are going to receive that rest we are going to receive that rest in our mind and when the mind is at rest knowing his promise we are going to receive everything that God has promised us in his word verse number 29 take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls so here Jesus is saying in verse number 29, he's saying, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. He gives us the answer how to find rest for our souls. You know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is God. That's what we read in, in, in John chapter 1 verse 1. Can we read John chapter 1 verse 1? Because you must understand, Jesus is not just someone whom we are going to celebrate his birthday on 25th. He came on this earth, he died, and then he went back to the Father. Jesus is God. He's, he's, he's God who became man for you and me. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word was God. Brothers and sisters, we understand in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. If everyone says the word was God, the word is God. The word is God. Please understand this word that we are speaking right now. We are speaking about God. God, the word is God. Jesus is the, is the word that became flesh. So Jesus is God. With John chapter 1 verse 14, they says the word became flesh. And so if the word is God and the word became flesh, Jesus is God. So at the name of Jesus, everyone and everything with a knee will bow and confess him as Lord. And yet this God, yet this Lord, yet this Savior is meek and humble in heart. Please understand my brothers and sisters, this is the creator. He can speak a word and everything will turn to ashes. And yet this God, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this God, as we read in Matthew chapter 1, 11 verse 29, it says, he is gentle and humble in heart. You know, my brother says, it's such an awesome thing to have a God who is humble and gentle in heart. You know, my brother says, that Jesus came humbly announcing his birth to, to, to shepherds instead of kings. We read that in Luke chapter 2, verses uh, around 8 to 14. You know, Jesus could have announced it, you know, uh, in, in, among the kings. He could have announced it to Emperor Caesar or he could have announced it some, to some VIP saying that he's, he's coming to the earth. But you don't hear that. He announces it to only lowly shepherds that he's going to come to this earth. Jesus was born in the most humblest of circumstances. He was, Jesus was born to a young girl engaged to a common carpenter, Joseph. Can you imagine? God could have been born as, as the son of a king in, 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 in a palace. But he is now getting, he's going to be born of, of, a, of a woman who's going to get married to a very common laborer, a, a, a common carpenter. And later on, brothers and sisters, when Jesus started his ministry, he did such great signs and wonders. And yet the same Jesus is telling those whom he miraculously healed and delivered not to tell anybody. We read that in Matthew chapter 9 verse 30. We reflected on that uh, sometime last week. Again, after his resurrection, Jesus could have forced the people of, his, of Jerusalem to acknowledge him that he is their savior, that he is God. He could have just been flying over Jerusalem. But brothers and sisters, you read that there isn't a single recorded instance where he appeared to anyone except to the people who believed in him. He did not appear to, to, uh, to Caiaphas. He never appeared to Pilate. He never appeared to Herod. He never appeared to the Pharisees. These were the people who troubled him. These were the people who killed him. He could have appeared to them and he could have said, see, look at me, I'm alive. And he could have, he could have really shaken them up. But you don't find anything like this. Now listen to this, my brothers and sisters. Jesus could force us. He can force you and force me into acknowledge him. But that's not what he is. 
He could write our names and his instructions on our lives on every cloud that passes by. But he won't do that. He can have birds sitting on your shoulder who could speak to us in our ears. He could speak to us in an audible voice. But he will not do that. He is meek and humble in heart. You know my brothers and sisters, God will reveal himself to us in a very gentle and a very subtle way. Please understand, God does not speak to us in, in a loud voice like, like thunder and lightning. Many people want to see some supernatural. In these days, there is a video going around of some picture where they see the light and people are so fascinated by lights. And you know, my brothers and sisters, these are the things that are actually distracting us because the enemy uses all these things of distraction and takes us away from the truth of God's word. You know, my brothers and sisters, it takes faith to perceive the Lord because that's the only way we can please him. Let me say this one more time. You know, it takes faith to perceive or to realize the Lord's presence because that's the only way we can please him. That's what it says in Hebrew chapter 11 verse 6. Hebrew chapter 11 says, verse 6 says, it is impossible to please God without faith. You know my brothers and sisters, those who are always looking for something spectacular, Something, you know, very majestic. Something very, you know, something which is very, very pompous. They are going to miss God. They are absolutely going to miss God. I want to take you to 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 11 to 13. You know, the prophet Elijah, he wanted to have an experience of God. And you know, when the prophet Elijah wanted to have an experience of God, he, he found that before he really experienced God's presence, there was an earthquake, there was a thunder, there was lightning, there were so many things that happened. But just see how Elijah experienced the presence of God. 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 11 to 13. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong, that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So brothers and sisters, Although so many very fierce things happened, there was an earthquake, there was a, there was a rock splitting, but only in that gentle wind, Elijah was able to experience the presence of God. And you know, my brothers and sisters, Psalm 46.10, it tells us, be still and know that I am God. That's what the Lord says. The psalmist writes in Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. Many a times we are talking, 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 talking. We want to fast. We want to, we want to sing songs. We want to shout. We want to clap. And very truly, the Lord tells us in Psalm 46.10, just be still, just experience his presence, just experience his love, just experience his, his, his inner presence inside of you. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when we silence ourselves, when we just stay quietly in the presence of God without opening our mouth, we just need to make sometimes a practice to keep to zip our mouths and not to open our mouths because we always are opening our mouths when we don't have to open our mouths and we keep our mouth shut when we need to open our mouths and therefore brothers and sisters we need to practice to keep our, a zip for our mouth and just experience the presence of God and, and understand his very presence within us you know my brothers and sisters this particular scripture that Jesus talked about in verse number 29 he's talking about rest for our souls Listen to this. He's not talking about rest for our spirits. He's talking about rest for our souls. Our born again spirits are already at rest because Christ is in that in our born again spirits. Our spirit, when Christ entered, has already having the Holy Spirit that has sealed our spirits and therefore there is no problem with our born again spirit. So any disturbance in our life, 
are always going to be to our soul, to our mind and to our bodies. And Jesus is saying, I will give rest unto your souls as well as I will give to your spirit. So he gives us rest to our spirits the day we were born again. But the moment we begin to take his word, renew this mind, rest in the finished works of Christ, rest in his promises, this mind will come to rest and we will begin to experience that peace, that rest in our souls. Okay, let's go back to verse number 29. So Jesus is talking about, he's saying, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart. You know, my brothers and sisters, a yoke, which all of many of you may have seen, you know, cows being, you know, ox, oxen being taken in the field in order to plow the field. A yoke is nothing but a wooden, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wooden piece made of two sections. The bottom portion of that yoke is, will, will be resting on the necks of the oxen, which are used to plow or to, you know, to draw a cart. You know, figuratively, a yoke symbolizes submission to Jesus because Jesus is admonishing us to submit ourselves to him. Please understand my brothers and sisters. Jesus is not telling us, you know, go like the cattle in the field, take that yoke and put it on your neck and put it on your wife's neck and start plying the field. That's not what he's talking about. He is talking about figuratively submitting ourselves to the yoke of the submit of the word of God. That means we need to submit ourselves to the word of God. We need to, he's, he's admonishing us. He's telling us, if you want to really have that rest, you must submit yourself to my word. For true rest, my brothers and sisters, comes only when we serve Jesus, not ourselves. I want to show you Matthew chapter 10 verses 38 to 39. Most of the time we are serving ourselves. We are serving our own interest, our own rest, our own food, our own, you know, our own benefits, our own family. What about serving the Lord? What about doing what he has called us to do? I want to show you Matthew chapter 10 verses 38 to 39. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Those who lose their life for my sake, says Jesus, they will find it. We need to ask ourselves, my brothers and sisters, this question. Am I dying to self or am I losing myself only for, for the kingdom of God? Or am I losing myself for my own pleasure? I'm working hard in order to get that bank balance, to see my retirement benefits. Even I'm going to see that, you know, every food is there on my table. I'm not saying that you stop doing all those things, but are we dying to self so that we are able to obey the word of God, the instruction the Holy Spirit is giving us each day? How many times, my brothers and sisters, those who are even born again, those who have experienced the new life, they are living a life of only consuming the resources of this world. They are not bearing any fruit in the kingdom. We need to ask ourselves this question. Are we really dying to self? Are we really taking up our cross and following Jesus? You know, my brothers and sisters, a new ox, for example, you know, if, if, in, if in the field they, they want to have a new ox along with the old ox, a new ox was often trained by plying or, or, or drawing a cart by yoking it with an experienced ox. Because that experienced ox knew already the job, he knew how to take the cart, he knew how to plow the field. So they used to always take a new ox and, 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 and put the yoke with him as long with an experienced ox. So the yoke kept on the young ox would help that young ox from doing its own thing because the new ox would be very stubborn. And it soon learned obedience to its master. That's how the new York, Yorks, uh, ox learned how to do the job of drawing the cart or plowing the field because it was put along with an experienced ox. And if we tried to do anything, the experienced ox would actually keep that new ox who was stubborn and rebellious from moving and doing his own thing. And now in the same way, when we commit ourselves to being yoked to Jesus, we also will begin to learn how to obey his word. You know, my brothers and sisters, if we want to become mature Christians, we must learn to submit to Jesus and his word. Let me say this one more time. Put it in capital block letters on your notebooks today. If you want to become a mature Christian, you must learn and I must learn to submit to God's word. We must submit to Jesus. That's the time we are going to grow from little babies to becoming mature Christians. You know, my brothers and sisters, unlike the sometimes very harsh treatment oxen were given to bring them into submission, 
Jesus is meek and humble. He is not going to stay with a stick. He is not going to stay with a whip and whip you and me in order to obey. But what does Jesus do? He is meek and gentle in heart and he wins us over by his love. He wins us over by his unconditional love. 1 John chapter 4 verse 11 and 19. I want you to read that. I want to show you that we don't have a taskmaster who is staying with a whip and a stick. You do something wrong, he's going to beat you up. No, 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 my brothers and sisters. He's a God who is meek and humble and he wins us over with his unconditional love. 1 John 4, 11 and 19. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to to love one another verse 19 we love because he first loved us we love because he first loved us you know my brothers and sisters if you and I are going to love our fellow men we are going to love the Lord back we cannot love him with our own human love we can only love him with the love that he has loved us and that is why when we receive the new birth, we receive the Holy Spirit. The word of God says in Romans chapter 5 verse 5, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You know my brothers and sisters, unless we are born again, unless we have received the new birth, unless the Holy Spirit is poured into our hearts and the love of God has been poured into our hearts, we will never be able to love anybody around us. We will only live a selfish life. We will only be living a self-conscious life. We will only be worried about what others are saying to us. We will never be able to abandon abandon ourselves to this God and therefore brothers and sisters Jesus only is meek and humble in heart and he wins us by his love and you know my brothers and sisters just like you put a new oxen with an experienced oxen when we submit ourselves to Jesus and his word Jesus pulls more of his share of the load therefore our burden becomes very light you know, if you really want to have your burden light in this life, you want to take less pressure, less worry, less depression, less anxiety. Just go and do what the word says. Obey, submit to the word. And when you submit to the word, Jesus is going like, like, like that oxen, that experienced oxen going to pull more of the weight. Jesus is going to pull more of the share of the load and we will find our burden is light. We will not be having any tension and worries of this life because we know and we know that we have put our trust in this loving Savior. Verse number 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why is Jesus' yoke easy? You know, you know my, my, my brothers and sisters, many times people often say serving God is very tough. They say serving God is very tough. It, it is better to go to the office and do some work in the office, find some job. At least at the end of the month, I'll have a salary. And when I get that salary, I will be able to feed my family. I'll be able to do that. Very true. No one says you don't find a job. But you know, my brothers and sisters, serving God is not a tough thing. It is not true. If we serve Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth, it is easy and his burden is very light. Please understand my brothers and sisters, if anyone is serving the Lord in spirit and in truth, not with their own effort, but in spirit and in truth, it is going to be absolutely exciting serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Even when we go through tough times, my brothers and sisters, Jesus carries our load. That's what he says. That's what 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 7 says. Can we read that? In 1 Peter chapter 5, it is Jesus who carries all our load. If we are burdened down under life's load, it is a clear indication, my brothers and sisters, that we are not resting in him. Please re listen to this very carefully. If we are burdened down under loads in this life, it is a very clear indication that we are not resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to show you the last verse for today. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your cares onto him. Cast all your anxieties onto him. Cast unto him to, to whom? Cast all your anxieties unto Jesus because he cares for you and me, my brothers and sisters. If we have a God who came here on this earth and died for you and me and now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's just looking to you and me to believe what he has done, then it is more important for us brothers and sisters to cast. And how do you cast? You cast your burdens by taking his promise. 
believing his promise doing what his word says and the moment you begin to do what his word says in the midst of your situation and circumstances you and I are going to experience rest and you know my brothers and sisters once our mind is at rest we don't need to go and have a good long sleep three four hours five hours are very good enough people think I must sleep for eight hours I must sleep for nine hours then only I will be refreshed that is all science that will tell you but the moment you begin to rest with God's word brothers and sisters you will be far more efficient than a person who's resting for many hours who's eating you know not genetically modified food eating organic food somebody who's you know taking good rest and going to holidays I tell you 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 will be far more efficient and far more effective in the kingdom of God if you can only obey his word do what his word says because when we obey his word it's a clear indication that we are resting in him amen let us pray father in heaven we thank you and we praise you for giving us the understanding of how to rest in Christ Lord all this life we have been trying to do things on our own whether it is at our workplace whether it is in our homes whether it is in our church whether it is in 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 in, in, in every devotion that we need to we are always trying to do something in order to prove ourselves but your word says today that when we believe your word when we submit to your word we let you take over all our anxiety when we cast it onto you we begin to experience a rest which nothing in this world can give not even the 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 greatest mansion or the great or the best car or the biggest salary it can never give us that rest and today lord by teaching us the word help us to make the word of god our highest authority to give it the highest honor and place in our life so that by believing in your word we can experience the abundant life we can experience that rest in our souls and we can live the victorious life that you have promised us we thank you and we praise you father in the glorious name of jesus